welcome everybody to the sixth meeting ever of the East Midlands branch. Anybody who joins a meeting before our AGM in November will be considered a founding member. Um, so welcome founding members. Um, we'll have a little bit of uh, history and discussion afterwards, but I think I would like to welcome to the room, Rob. Thank it's you. our first ever speaker and people had asked about how do I get an agent? Do you need an agent? How do you get one that's your first time for an agent? And the one thing that I think, although I'm a stage manager, so I'm not in the acting sector, was a question that I hear a lot. And Ian very kindly introduced us. Um, we had a conversation and here you are. So tell us about you what you do and inform the room okay um I'll, i will start with me and how how i got into this business and maybe that'll give you kind of an insight into who i am that kind of thing um i wasn't going to be an actor that was never on my horizon um i uh, did a play at school probably like everybody else when i was about 16 loved it but it, acting was not something that was open to me or even possible, didn't even know you could be an actor. Um, and I uh, I came away to Coventry Polytechnic as it was then to do a degree. My dad had just died when I was 16, and I got three younger brothers, and I thought I could do something to help my mum and my family. So I did all of that, and I, when I came to the Polytechnic there, there was a drama society just starting up, and I thought, well, I enjoyed that doing a play, I'll go and do another play. So I did a play, really enjoyed it, went to Catholic. Um, played Derek the Teddy Boy, and the girl who directed it, Lil, said, you should be an actor. And I said, literally, how do, be, how do you be an actor? I've got no idea. And um, so she said, well, you need to get to drama school or, you know. So she helped, she coached me to audition for Bristol and a couple of other places. And then there was a theatre company starting up in Coventry called TikTok. Um, and they were looking for actors. And I auditioned for them, and I got into the company. So I just thought, I'm going to go with this because this is work straight away. It's experience. And I stayed with that company for nine years, essentially. I don't know if you know Coventry, if you're from Coventry, but you might have heard of TikTok. Um, we, we really succeeded as a small, small scale theatre company, uh, working class theatre company, um, writing our own work. And we had a business model as well. So what we used to do was go to Edinburgh every year, um, hire some buildings, convert them into theatres, and then sublet them to other companies coming to the festival or do deals with the uh, people coming to the festival. So we ended up promoting people early doors in their careers, people like Frank Skinner, um, I'm just trying to think of people, all the people, <laughs> comedians that were around then, um, uh, Harry Enfield, <laughs> get hold of that. All the people who were around at that time in the early days of kind of um, uh, alternative comedy in the 80s, we were promoting those people. And then we thought, well, we've got this model, it works quite well. So the money that we made from that actually subsidized our theatre company. So we paid us full time all year round. Um, we got one arts council grant, I think, over the period that I was with us with the theatre company. But um, we were mainly self-funded and then we had the great idea of buying a building in Coventry so we started up when the comedy was kind of taken off of doing a Thursday night comedy night which you know is everywhere now but we used to do a comedy night for all these comedians touring the country and we called it the TikTok club and then we eventually I think it was around 1989 or we bought this old bingo hall in Coventry was on the market for something like 65 grand and uh, you can't imagine it now but the, we bought it with money from West Midlands Enterprise and Brewery and got a lot of money sort of put into the building and so we had this kind of amazing kind of business model really of being an enterprising theatre company but actually producing new and radical work um, we produced a play called Hooligans which won a Fringe first at the Edinburgh Festival in 1987 and uh, and that really kind of boosted us as well. Um, that was made for TV then as well. I was in that with the other two other actors that were in that. 
Um, and the, the theatre company just kind of went from strength to strength until we bought this building. And I think, um, I wouldn't say it was the ruin of us, but it certainly caused us to all, all to fall apart, essentially. Um, we borrowed, I don't know, the best part of a million pounds. Uh, using other people's money is always best. <laughs> but of course, it's always tied up to cap to kind of things that you own as well. So we, because we've been doing okay, we all bought our houses around that time. And we put our houses against the overdraft and all that kind of business. Um, and then we, I think it was about a million pounds in the end we borrowed. And suddenly, you will know if you were around at that time, interest rates went up from nothing to 13% yeah. overnight. And so we borrowed all this money, and suddenly everyone was going, we want to be paid. But we, it was an incredible business. It was people queuing around the door, uh, queuing around the block to get in, and the massive, the biggest beer account for Ansel in the middle of the world. Um, but we couldn't service the debt. So we had a big fallout amongst the board, and there were seven of us on the board, and four of them decided to vote three of us off, so they made us redundant. And... Um, their idea was to pay them really ridiculously, to pay themselves more and uh, and to carry on running the business that we would leave. And to be honest, it got to this point for me anyway, where we weren't we weren't doing as much theatre as I wanted to do. Although I was kind of like the company manager on the road and I was still in all the plays and all that kind of thing, the building became quite a bit of a distraction. Um, and sucked up a lot of our energy and time. So I was kind of, I, although it was a big wrench for me, me and the other two guys were obviously really disappointed when we got made redundant. Um, but I think it was, in retrospect, it was a really good thing because even then at the board meeting, I remember sitting around the table and I said, if you do what you're going to do, then, well, I don't, I don't think the business will last. And in fact, they managed to pawn some money out. Composite Council had another hundred thousand pound, I think it was. Then they went past a year later. And at that time, we couldn't, we, we just, well, don't ever do this if you're ever listening to the things like this. Don't ever sort of sign a joint and several guarantee because it means that if you're in a joint and several guarantee, the people who you owe money to can come to any one of you for all of the money. Um, so we ended up basically you know, paying money back that we. Had no control over. We'd left the business a year late, you know, a year earlier. Um, but I, I'm, I'm kind of, I don't have any bitterness about this. It was a great experience. And for the times that we were on the road as a theatre company, the, the creativity we had as an organisation, I absolutely applaud that. And I don't think I could have learned any better at the drama school or anywhere else. Um, just doing the job, and whether it was writing or performing or producing or having. And working in a theatre company was the best, well, best, you know, start to my career. I absolutely loved it. Um, so when I left, I I just started with family as well. So I thought, what am I going to do? So I started to do what every other actor does, realise quick, quite quickly, you're not working all the time if you're not in a theatre company. So um, I was getting all sorts of jobs like everybody else, bar, you know, waiting and all that kind of stuff. Um, and some good jobs as well, and uh, and bringing up a young family. And I decided at that point as well not to go touring much anymore. So I did mainly kind of filming, I suppose, and, and local stuff. Stuff that was on my doorstep. And, and I'm very much rooted in the community. I think I love small-scale theatre. I love seeing performers with the veins standing out in the <laughs> yeah. room and giving that kind of passion and then telling a story. I absolutely love that. Um, so I, I kind of uh, carried on doing this acting and I, because I think because of my kind of commercial mind I suppose as well I started doing some consulting for people like Coventry Rugby Club I started to do their commercial work for them so I was bringing in sponsors for them advertising all that stuff and I managed to work that around having bits and bobs of acting as well because I was self-employed so they just got me when they had me in and that was good enough for them. And I did that for about eight or nine years. Um, and that worked really well. And then I've um, been doing quite well as an actor on and off. And then I think you probably all remember the crash of 2009. 
everything that, that I was doing then was mainly kind of role play and kind of um, working with industry as well, so commercial kind of work really. Um, everything came to a stop. And uh, I suddenly had to get like another, you know, call centre job. <laughs> so I got a call centre job. And while I was doing this call centre job, uh, my old agent, Nicky, rang me up one day and said, um, I'm packing this up. I don't know if any, does anybody know Nicky Reeves? From uh, NJR Management, lovely, lovely one. And she just rang up and said, I can't do this anymore. It's really difficult. I'm not making any money. But I think you'd be good at it. And that was in 2012, I think early 2012. So I had a chat with my wife and we said, okay, let's give it a go for a year. Let's see what happens in a year. And of course, actually no idea what to do with big <laughs> Absolutely no idea. But instinctively, you know what to do because you've been searching for jobs yourself. You've been working with your agent. And Nikki was very good at, you know, pointing me in the right direction with many things. Um, but after the first year, I've, I basically took about 20 people, excuse me, from NJR management, who were people I knew, trusted, but they were all kind of about the same age as me, all a bit middle-aged, all a bit white. Um, and... It didn't work. After a year, I just knew that this was no way, there's no way you can run an agency of 20 actors. Everybody wants the boutique agency. Everybody wants that one-to-one -one personal management, but actually that's not a reality. And when you look at the figures in the industry of, you know, only 10% of actors are working at any one time. And if you've only got two actors working, how are you going to make any money? So, I knew at that point that I had to expand, <clears throat> and that was the only way it was going to work. Um, so we got some funding from Coventry University to get some mentoring from some arts, arts, some arts mentors. And uh, I met this woman whose name is Gates now. She was a producer on BBC Doctors, Natasha Kailish. Um, she also produced a BFI award-winning short film, I think, called The Bouncer. With Ray Winston in a really great film. Um, and I went to meet her at her home in Shrewsbury. She invited me to go out there. <laughs> so this was probably 2013. And uh, I got a website and got all the basic stuff. And she said, okay, bring, bring a business plan. Show me what you can do. And she, she was a producer then, I think, or just finished on Doctors, done 200 odd episodes on, you know, very experienced kind of uh, TV woman. And um, so I sent him a business plan and we met in this cafe outside the station in Shrewsbury. And she, she listened to my plan. She had a look at it and everything. And uh, she said, yeah, I think you've got the right idea. I think you've got the right idea. She said, you need at least 100 actors because nobody's going to take you seriously having 20 actors. <laughs> You're in a desert in the Midlands and... If somebody looks at your agency, they're going to think there's 20 middle aged people just stuck in it. <laughs> and that's not what you want. You need to look like you've got an offer. You need diversity. You need great range in age. You know, so and I'm, that's why I put it in my plan, essentially. <clears throat> um, so it was really good to have it kind of recognized. <clears throat> so if you're going to do this, you'll be okay. And if you put, you know, if you put your arms all into it. So that's what I did. Um, and she said, as she said, uh, one of the front, funny things she said as well, she said, maybe you don't mind me meeting you in this cafe. Uh, but um, I just thought he must be a fucking nut who wanted to do this. <laughs> said, There's so many nutters in this business <laughs> that you just have to, you know, find out. First of all, are they a nutter? If they are, then, you know, you can leave that behind. But if they're not and they've got something real to offer, then let's let's work together and she was a great inspiration really great inspiration so i then basically started to recruit people pretty pretty slowly organically i suppose introductions from people i knew going to see theater going to meet people um and it grew and it grew and it grew and i think we got up to about 100 and i, I can't remember the exact timeline but over the next so we were growing slowly and slowly slowly and I still was doing my um, call centre job, you know, actor call centre job, um, up till 2019, I want to say. 2019, I think. 
And then at that point, I thought, okay, I can stop now. I can put that to one side. The agency is starting to work. And I can actually sit in this chair comfortably and do this 24 hours a day. It does feel like 24 hours a day. So I started to work full time in the agency then for 2019. And to be honest, I've been working full time in it before because I did, you know, um, probably all actors have done this, but in years I was at the call centre, I did three shows at the Belgrade where I managed to persuade the people at the call centre I was working in to change my shifts mm -hmm. so that I could rehearse in the daytime, call centre in the evening, and then when the show was on, I did uh, shift in the daytime, shows in the evening. Oh. We all probably juggle stuff like that, and I think that's one of the things that I really admire about actors, is it is so difficult. You know, we all have different kind of versions of what we want to be in terms of acting or performing, but we all have to juggle all these things, whether it's money, family, your dog, whatever, it's it's all there to be juggled. And it's such a difficult thing to do, really. So I, that's why I admire actors so much. I love what they do. And if they can cope, if they can cope with this kind of life as well, which is ridiculously, ridiculously unpredictable, which you all know, it, it, I just really take my hat off to them. I just absolutely love them and they're amazing. And so I've put a lot of love into this company um, and I hope that uh, the people who join us understand that I really care about it as well. And we now have six agents who all feel the same way. They're all actors, we've all, we're all actors. We all understand what it's like to be an actor, what it's like to juggle stuff, what it's like to have no money, what it's like to be on a high because you've just done an amazing show and then the next week you're doing nothing. And that's the reality of it. And so I, I hope we're really grounded. I hope that people understand when they come to our agency that um, we, we, we all agree with this for all of the agents that it's an open door policy sounds trite, but actually one of the important things I say to people at the end of any interview, I normally have an hour interview with somebody because the attitude and the interview is kind of more important to me than the skill and the talent. You can have the talent, but you can be an arsehole. <laughs> um, and I want people who, firstly, are, are nice and they're happy to go into a room. And I know that people who meet them will go, I really like meeting them. And I don't want egos. People have egos, of course they have egos. But you need to know how to manage all that stuff. Um, and it's, it's probably difficult when you're younger and you're full of yourself, but also it's, I think I, I do like to interview people for attitude. It's really, really important for me. Um, so we're moving on, and then I think one of the big things that probably, you know, you, we've all been through the pandemic, um, and it was a, the pandemic was a really big turning step for our agency because, you know, Everything closed. We had people in theatres. We had people doing TV jobs. Everything stopped. And you, you've all experienced that. And that feels kind of empty, doesn't it? What's coming then is it's bad enough when you're doing this as a business for your life all that time. But then you think you can't see anything on the horizon. That's really difficult. Um, but it was at that point, uh, and I said this to my wife, too. What are we going to do? <laughs> What's going to happen? Like everybody else did. And she said, well, we've got a bit of money in the bank. We've got some reserves or what have you. Let's just carry on for next year. What can you do in the next 12 months if there's no theatre, if there's no TV, if nothing happens? I said, the only thing we can do really is to improve. That won't cost anything. We can hopefully give people some hope. And the other thing that we did over this period as well was we did, we started to do it already because one of the things I wanted to do when I built the agency was to build a community more than just an agency. I don't like actors to think that they're, well, they're just a number on our books. We, so we've had, um, I don't know how many talks we've held, we've had workshops in Birmingham, Coventry, we had um, Oh, Hannah Miller, the head of casting from the RSC, came and did a workshop for us. You came to that one, didn't you, Maggie? 
So one of the things I really wanted to do was try and educate people as well, so that you can meet casting directors, you can meet directors, you can meet people who work in this business, and realise they're all just human. Writers, the writers. Writers, writers, writers yeah, yeah. Debbie is here, but also all sorts of different people come and do talks for us. So we did all these red talks, did those on Zoom, obviously through the lockdown, and we started to recruit people. And then a big thing happened, because you probably all experienced this as well, that kind of lockdown was an amazing time in many ways. Because so many more people opened up to other people, opened up to each other. You could suddenly speak to people. People would have time. <laughs> people would talk to you. People would have a Zoom with you. Incredible. I, and I met so many people just literally by dropping them a line and saying, Can we have a chat? So I met more agents, which I didn't know before. I met producers and I met casting directors. It just my, my circle of kind of people that I knew grew massively during the lockdown. And then we were recruiting actors as well. And then I met an agent called Fiona Kelly Scott. Do you know Kelly Scott in London? They're quite a big agency, really good agency. And she's the managing director of that. And uh, she said, you should be in the PMA. And I said, how do you get the PMA? She said, well, you need to be recommended. I'll recommend you. <laughs> so she recommended us against the PMA. And we, I think we've grown to about four or five agents then. We now have six. And since we got into the PMA, our um, castings that we get through Spotlight have changed completely. So we were a little Midlands agency, but I'm, you probably recognise this if you're living in the East Midlands or anywhere outside of London, you get a call. Um, maybe not as it, maybe as actors, I don't know how it works that way around, but certainly through my agency, if people rang in the early days, said, so Can we see whoever the next day in London at 10 o'clock? And I'd say, well, could you do 12 or one o'clock just so they can get a, you know, a train and might be cheaper? And they go, oh, well, where are they coming from? I'd say, well, Birmingham. It would be silence. <laughs> or just like, oh, uh, yeah, OK. Uh, and some of them were a bit sniffy and snobby about it. Mm. That's always been there, I think. Yeah. And it's still there. It's mm. still there. Mm. But. I think it's been broken down a lot by the pandemic as well. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the pandemic, we suddenly were overwhelmed with work. One of the reasons for that was because some of the really big agencies, whose all their staff were on um, as it fell. Mm -hmm. So when things started to open up, they couldn't service breakdowns. And suddenly we were getting more and more auditions. And, um, and people and casting directors were desperate to get actors. So then we started to look further afield and that the country opened up. It really did. Um, and so we, we grew, I think, kind of exponentially during that period. Um, so I really look with some fondness on the pandemic, although I hate what it was and what it did to people. Um, but I think there were some benefits out of it as well, some incredible benefits. Um, the growth. You know, the personal relationship, everything, all sorts of things. And so I'm not recommending another pandemic. <laughs> so uh, tell us a little bit more about sort of the PMA, what that is, your relationship with Spotlight, and a little bit about how actors can break down this um, awe that they have of how do you get a an how do you get an agent? Tell us a little bit about that. People form, start to formulate some questions if you've got any questions for um, Rob. And also on Zoom, if you've got any questions, please put those in the chat. So, yeah, let's get a little bit more industrial. Yeah. yeah. So the PMA is the Personal Managers Association, and it's I suppose it's a V industry body for agents. There is another one. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, agents Association. That's right. And there's a cooperative agents association. Oh, is there? Yeah, there is. There's a, yeah. That's right. That's so good. you're on the premiership. <laughs> okay, they so were in the Premiership. Yeah, so there's lots of agents in this, and they are some of them are huge, like United and all those people. But some of them are like us, who are just, you know, I work in a shed, like you do. Um, and all of our agents, our six agents, are all based from home. So we have a very small carbon footprint. Uh, we all work from home. And I, you know, I've done that for 10 years before the pandemic. 
Um, the PMA is an incredible body, and I've learned more and more. I've, I've seen the bad sides of it as well because I've actually, you know, you've probably witnessed some of this if you've ever been in a PMA meeting or gone walked into one of these things. But there are some really old school people in PMA. Uh, you probably <laughs> see it as well. And you think, some of them you just think, what planet you? Well, I just, how can you work in this world, work in that way? Um, and personal experience of some agents that I've met on through the PMA thought I wouldn't want to be in your agency. But there are some amazing people there as well, and really amazing people. People who work with equity, really closely with equity, to get good deals for actors. Um, it's you know it's really worth having. The combination of the two I think is formidable. Um, mm. And in fact, the first big deal that we did as an agency was. This year? Last, so last July, last summer, one of our actors uh, had just been in sex education and then got brought into The Witcher, um, Julia Alexandra. And uh, because they've done, I can't say too much actually, because it hasn't come out yet, but because they were doing a project with several other actors um, through uh, Netflix. Um, the, all the agents of these actors worked together. So we all got together and we worked as a team to say, we want to get the best deal for our actors. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we appointed an American lawyer, uh, Julian Zajfren, his name is, from Zipfren Law, I think it's in California, um, to do the deal for us. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at the pedigree of some of those people, who do these deals. They're doing them all the time. Um, because you've got six actors, he had some weight to so say this is what we want to speak about. And they got a really, really good deal. And um, in fact we've, you know, I met Julian in London six weeks ago and we have a relationship with him now and he's just doing another deal for another actor for us who's going into that to Pendragon was it yeah. that bit. <laughs> so uh, the PMA for me has been really useful and you know I recommend it for any agency to get into really I think it's really important. They have monthly meetings where they explain different bits of business, they go through business that might be causing problems, whatever they're doing, dealing with equity. There's updates on the Sargaftra um, you know, strike in America, which is having a big impact at the moment. It, it's just really useful. And you stay really on top of all of those as an agent. So First candidate, someone's come out of drama school or they go, I want to be an actor. Um, how do you approach candidates? How do they approach you? What are you looking for? And if you can give any examples of sort of the last two or three people you've taken onto your agency, why did you choose them? And what was it about them that brought them onto your books? Because you can't have everybody. No. We understand that. <laughs> but how? what is it yeah. that people need to start looking at in themselves if they're going to want to attract a, an agent? How, how do they get to you? Yeah. And then again, anybody's got any questions, mm -hmm. please do either raise your hands. Um, otherwise, I will talk to Rob for the next 20 minutes. Um, it, and as I said earlier on, for me, it is about the meeting. So that's really important for me. Whether it's on Zoom or in person, I prefer in real life. I've auditioned people in my kitchen many times. And in fact, some of the people I've auditioned in my kitchen have been totally blown away by it. Initial um, contact for us is always, please just email us. I mean, honestly, the number of you know platforms we have now, Twitter, Instagram, everything else, everybody messages me on these things to say, how do we get to your agency? And I just have to say the same thing I've done. Just drop us an email. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about what you've done to date. Send us your spotlight CV if you have one. We don't have to have we don't have to have spotlight because now as PMA members, we can recommend somebody to go on spotlight. Mm. Um, so how much chicken and egg is there? You know, you've got to have been an actor to be able to get an agent. How much would you expect someone to have done before? What what makes them an actor to come to you as an agent? They, they, to me, they don't have to have done anything. There are some people who've come onto our book and I've gone, wow, straight away, just seeing them. Um, With an audition speech, have they prepared anything? Yeah, we simply asked, asked them to do um, an audition speech for a self-tape 
or whatever we whatever we particularly want to see from them. Mm. And sometimes it's just going to see them in the theatre, get invited to go and see a showcase at a student college or anywhere at Blue Orange in Birmingham or any small theatre. I'll go and see those shows because sometimes you see people in those places not be seen anywhere else. You go, wow, this is incredible. When you see the veins stand up on the neck, <laughs> sorry, it's just that thing of being so close personally to actors mm. in the studio. So I, I love it. Um, yeah, so I personally, if you've got experience, great, that's all good. You can see that on a CV, um, but actually, it's what you can do in the room, and mm. that's what always really important. Questions? There are hands up, and there's a chat thing. Mm -hmm. so, oh, I've got to say, it's in chat. Um... Jay, okay. unmute yourself. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask something that's just generally confused me about having an agent in general. Um, it does the location, like your agent's base location, does that matter to like I'm wording this weirdly. Uh should you be getting an agent that works in the general area that you work in, or like if they're an England agent, would it be acceptable to email them or just try an audition with them? So are you asking whether you need somebody in your geographical region? Is that what you mean? Yeah. I, yeah. I don't think you do, no. I don't think it's really that important. Mm -hmm. I think I started in the Midlands because I knew Midlands actors and I knew, I know there's a lot of talent in the Midlands and it's never been fully exposed Um so that's why I started in the Midlands, because I wanted to give Midlands actors opportunities. We've grown now so that we have a, an agency in Manchester, an agent in Manchester, a couple in the East Midlands, so there's Kelsey in uh, Northampton, excuse me, um, and then we've got Nate Morrison, who's a Brummy lad, who's a musical theatre performer, he runs our musical theatre team, he's in London, he's in Moulin Rouge at the moment, it, I don't think it really matters now where you are. It did before. I think it definitely did. And one of the great things that's happening in the Midlands, which you're probably aware of, is um, Create Central. is a, a body that's been set up to promote film and TV making in the West Midlands. And it's making great strides to do that. Kudos just opening an office in Birmingham, aren't they? Mm. Like, run by a guy called, oh, what's his name? Come back to him in a minute. He was the producer on uh, Sex Education when Juliet was in Sex Education. In fact, we had a conversation. But, um, so it's really incredible what's happening in Birmingham at the moment for TV and film. And there's other pockets of this going on all over the country as well. People are realizing that, well, especially from the pandemic, that you know content is king. People needed content. And suddenly now we all need it. We're, we're all watching telly or computer films or whatever now, much, much more. Yeah. And that content is there to be made. Does that answer your question, Jay? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Cool. Okay, I'm going to come into the room with um, Carol and then we'll come to Tracy. Yeah, I've just got a couple of questions, uh, really, two parts. Um, could you talk a bit, because you did mention it before, about diversity and equality in terms of agents and, and getting agents and working with agents and um, particularly i mean are you based in Coventry or Birmingham? I'm in Coventry yeah. yeah yeah so so the demographics of places like Birmingham you've had somewhere like Leicester or Derby or even Nottingham are very different they're smaller and you know I'd be interested to know what you what you'd say about that and just just a straightforward question have you heard of Femi Ugun's Right. Okay. Because Femi, Femi, Femi has an interesting story. Um, Femi is now an agent, and he's one of the biggest agents in Hollywood. He's Nigerian. I should have heard him. This is what I thought. So I thought if you haven't heard of him, you're going to find out about him. But just to say that Femi uh, realised he wasn't going to make it as an actor. So what he did was he set up a drama school in Brixton called the Identity Drama School. I know. Yeah. Talking about that, right? You do now, because yeah. I was thinking you must know who he is, yeah. because he's got John Boyega, he's got Letitia Wright, yeah. he's got Cynthia Riva. And um, 
you know, his story is really inspirational. And now he's got identity school in Hollywood. I know one of his tutors at school. He's also bought a theatre in London. So I just wanted to know if he was on your radar. <laughs> so tell me so, about yeah. diversity and equality in terms of, you know, yeah. black and brown people and disabled women in general, just, just the whole intersectionality in terms of how that works for your agency and what you've learned at the PMA. Yeah, um, certainly when I set out to build the agency, diversity was at the forefront of what I'm going to do because I've been in that conversation with Natasha, you know, mm -hmm. all, it's a very white organisation. And I said, I absolutely don't, but I do need to do something about this. And you know, I have good friends in all kind of, I suppose, all kinds of all, all different kind of parts of the community. Um, I grew up with a very closely with an Indian family as a young boy, and my best mate Sean is Indian. And I we always had fights at school because we he was the only brown person in our in our town, so we were always getting into trouble because I was a friend. And I am, well, yeah, I, I actually sought to make our agency as diverse as I possibly could. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that includes disability. Mm -hmm. um, well, the first black actor that I recruited is a woman called Tonya Daly Campbell. Mm -hmm. who Tracy knows probably, or maybe, uh, who is here. Midlands Councillor. Yes, yes, yeah. I know her. She is an amazing woman. Um, and I first came across her through a very white ginger haired actor. Well, I won't name, but was full of himself, young actor, and I didn't know any better at the time. But <laughs> I should have sensed that he was going to be trouble. But anyway, he he showed me, he sent me a film of him. He'd done a short film. It was filmed in something like Fuerte Ventura or something like that. It was a cowboy film, and it was about a cowboy who was um, in the Civil War and got shot and wounded, and then this... He wanders through the desert and, and comes across this house, and this woman, Tonya, um, nurses him to help. And the film, you know, he sent it to me, he said, you have a look at this, I'm amazing in them. And he didn't say that, but that was what he was kind of implicating. I think I'm amazing in this. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I watched it. And I went, okay. Um, but who is that? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Honestly, Tonya, I can take my eyes off her. No, no words in the play, no, no words in the film, but just incredible acting. Yeah. And I just said to him, who is that? Um, who's that woman in the, uh, in the film with you? Oh, it's Tonya, you know, blah, blah, blah. Acting. Yeah. Can you come in touch with that? Um, not very helpful. No, no I can it But anyway, I managed to track her down and dropped her a message on Facebook, I think, or something yeah. like that. Said, I loved your work in this film. I represented she and I am represented at the moment. So but you know, great I'd love to just have a chat with yeah. someone anyway. About six months later, yeah. she dropped me a line and said, My aim is just closed. Yeah. I'd love to have a chat. So I went to meet yeah. him at Hampton, she was doing a show. There's dogs and the blacks and the Irish. There's a uh, an actor in it as well called Arane Johnson. So uh, Tonya and Arane joined straight away pretty much. And I kind of made, I suppose, Tonya is a really good friend now. But I suppose she is also an ambassador for our company as well. She... Uh, <laughs> sorry, I feel really emotional about her because she's helped me so much. Um, Sorry. <laughs> Touch the sensitive spot. Yeah. Maybe while you're gathering yourself, I'm very interested in terms of, you know, how you feel. You told us so much about your journey, how you think you 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 progress with diversity and where you think diversity sits and equalities with the PMA where we are now from where we may have been before. If yeah. I could ask that while you you're gathering. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I'll, That's okay. This, this is a two uh, the I've, my, I've just lost my sister-in-law, so I'm feeling oh. very kind of sensitive at the moment anyway. Yeah. But Tonya is honestly so close to my heart, and she's helped me so much with the agency. She's yeah. been our diversity champion for yeah. the agency since she joined, essentially. Yeah. And we've worked together on stuff to just absolutely be amazing. Woman. 
Um, and she is the person really that has helped me grow as a diverse agency. She is the pers that person, she's a key person in our agency. It's good to know that because it what you're saying is part of that what's been effective is to have a diversity champion within your agency. So, so that important. presumably sends a positive message. Do you do you have black and brown agents as well? We have a black agent. We had two black agents. Yeah. Um Lizzie Ada Jimmy has just resigned because she during the pandemic she had uh, cancer um mm. and had a baby as well at the same time. Um <laughs> Wow. <laughs> God. She got through the uh, cancer amazingly. It, she, she only found out at stage three, I think it was. Like a lot of people in the pandemic, they didn't go to the doctors or have you. Anyway, she walked through it. She's, she's fine now. She's clear. And the baby is absolutely amazing. He's at three now, I think. Um, and she was, she was an amazing agent, honestly. But she just said to me about three months ago, she said, I don't want to do this again. Mm. I just want to work with people with creative art. Mm. So, so, and I said, that's absolutely right. She said, just, but she has brought in some incredible people who looked to our agency. Um, and then we are uh, Nathaniel Morrison, who's um, our musical theatre agent, is black as well. He's in London. And again, he is such a champion for us in terms of diversity. Mm. Absolutely. He's really had to be involved with equity as well. Um, and he is always looking after, looking out for the best things for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, great call. Yeah. I think a okay. real yeah. foundation to discover. Yeah. I think yeah. with the East Midlands Thank branch being so new and, and, and green, finding out just the wealth of talent that there is here and I think you're going to be a real asset to, for us to find that way through especially for theatre and film and the different parts so let's come to Tracy and then we'll come to Gillian. Hi I'll just put my hand down because I'll forget <laughs> I think you think I've got another question um hi hi Robert hi. um I, I just kind of wanted you to kind of expand on kind of regional casting because we we know each other of old and and my sort of campaigning kind of within equity gosh I'm trying to think like 2023 when I founded the Birmingham branch one of the first motions I took to council was about regional casting and 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 then other branches have taken that call about regional casting and they uh, has eventually developed into the cast it here campaign and obviously god this is a long-winded question but as you know you know we we lost um kind of all the bbc a huge amount of production round about the time you were starting your agency round about 2012 and you know, you you've been very supportive of my kind of campaigning to fight back and bring things back into the region. Partly why Create Central exists is because I went and bent Andy Street's ear before he was even elected. Andy Street is our uh, metro mayor for the West Midlands, and um, and and it looks like things are getting better. What are your feelings? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got a long way to go, mm -hmm. real long way. I think um, even places like Leicester, you know, we've never had an actor audition for a show at this theatre. Oh, what? We've had people who have been in tours or whatever who come to this theatre, but we've never had an actor audition at this theatre here. We've had some actors audition at other, you know, theatres. Yeah, and worked at Derby and worked at Birmingham Brett. Um, the Albany Theatre in Coventry is now just looking for local actors for their, their productions that they're bringing that on. Um, they did a couple of years of Christmas Carol, which they just cast with local actors. They're doing Oliver Twist this year, I think, which, again, all local actors. I think it's still got a real long way to go. Um, and one of the that was one of the reasons why I've helped Tonya um, set up a thing called Heart Casting which is a Midlands based casting director, mm -hmm. um, because nobody was offering that service in the Midlands. So there can't be an excuse for people to say, well, we can't cast in the Midlands because it's not for actors, because that 
There's always been talent in this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I'm sure Tracy knows that in Western Europe. There's always been massive amounts of, 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 of talent in the East Midlands. I mean, I go back to when the Denman Agency was in Nottingham. That's yeah. when I my first job acting, started out in acting. But um, part of part of that issue is that there are directors who work with specific casting directors. Yeah. And I'm not that type of director. I like to do casting and open auditions because that's really interesting because that's when you get, first, you're giving more opportunity, but secondly, you might find someone who's absolutely amazing. And I'm all about local and regional because I don't feel everything amazing is in London. Yeah, There's a lot to be done, isn't there? Yeah. Does that answer your question, Tracy? Yeah, no, that's that's good to hear. Um, my my kind of mantra <laughs> is it's a okay. good start, but but we need more. Oh, and, 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 and and it does take a lot of breaking down that um snobbery. Like I I, I was sort of having a chat this morning to uh, an actress friend of mine who came on Zoom to our to our West Midlands meeting last night for the first time ever. And she said, oh, I've never really kind of plugged into equity. I've kind of always, always kind of been involved when, you know, we've had the speak, the speak, the, the member of staff from equity who comes and talks to you and goes through, shouldn't you have an equity debt? But I haven't really said, and she goes, it was so interesting. But then we got onto a conversation about she's she's lived in London for a long time. She's worked in the West End. She's a musical theatre actor. Um, and she she was saying, like, it, it's so cliquey. And she's clicked into Birmingham because she met me at a workshop audition in London. And I've kind of introduced her to lots of people. But I live in Birmingham. And she says, I, I, I kind of feel like I nobody knows me in Coventry and that's where I live. And she, she yeah. came back to Coventry because sadly her dad was dying of cancer. And also she's got a little girl and it's easier to have children in the regions than London. Yeah. Um, but but she's going, oh, no, part of me feels like, oh, I, I, shall I go back to London? And then I go, no, no, please don't. You're my best friend. I think moving, <laughs> moving around, <laughs> moving around the regions, I think is going to be really important. I think yeah. just that yeah. when people do say, well, who is where I am? And if we can move that around, I think that's going to be yeah. great. Yeah. So yeah. we're going to come to, we're going to come to. Sorry, can yeah. I just, just finish my sentence? What I was going to say is, and then she remembered she'd had an audition at the Albany this morning, which Rob just mentioned. Oh. So we go. Oh, good. Brilliant. <laughs> So, Gillian, then we'll come to Ishii, and then we'll probably take two more questions after that, and that will sort of bring us up to sort of around about 22, and then um, we'll see where we go from there. So, Gillian. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for coming. You're really welcome. Um, Karen asked you earlier um, what it was that you were looking for when people applied to you to come and, and join your agency. The flip side is there are a lot of people in the profession who don't have representation. Yeah. Why do you think they do or don't need it. Interesting. Yeah, I think, I think, well, certainly, if you are, if you're self-contained and motivated and you, oh, you should be doing this anyway whether you have an agent or not, and you're out there pushing yourself out there, you don't need to be represented. And now, as well, I think especially, a lot more casting directors are open to looking at CVs from people who aren't represented. I just think if you're with an agent, it is it's kind of an old school thing, isn't it, really? Um, well, we trust that agent because they've recruited that person because they saw something in them that was good, so we'll have a look at them. But I think you can work equally as much without an agent. I know lots of actors who don't have agents. I respect them totally. It's fantastic. Do it either way. There's no, there's no one rule for anybody, I don't think. We're all individuals, we can do whatever we like, we can choose our lives, what we do. We've chosen to do this ridiculous you know, job, and we do it however it fits best into our life, however, we can make it work the best. Great question, is she? Yes, hello, thank you very much for that very informative talk. I've really enjoyed it and absorbed it. Um, my question is very much linked to what Carol said about diversity and inclusion. 
so I I uh, produced and ran some comedy nights to platform diverse acts um, in the Midlands as well. Um, and that was pre-pandemic. It was post-Brexit. And I particularly picked a Brexit leave area to, um, to get some talk going, shall we say. <laughs> um, but my experience of actually um, putting on diverse acts was in the way people applied for it. So for instance, um, you've got your mainstream uh, white male and their application um, to perform is very, very different to say a woman and very, very different to a diverse act in their language, in the energy they're putting across. And what I found very early on was I was having to approach a lot more women because of the difference in confidence levels and in order to make it a more balanced bill in order to truly champion uh, diverse acts I had to do the work to go out and get them and I still do so I was just wondering if you had a similar experience in actually doing outreach work to get the diverse acts no but it's a good idea <laughs> uh, no, I think yeah, we have we do go out and look for diverse acts, definitely our actors. But um, I don't know, see why we couldn't do a showcase or something like that. Absolutely. And there's I have attended a couple of um, events in London where they've had I think it was called Bane, wasn't it? Bane casting showcase or something. Um, when Bane was a popular voting group, but that was pre-pandemic. Mm. Um, and we saw some amazing actors there, really amazing actors. In fact, I think we've recruited one or two from that. Um, so when those events are on, those all the interest me. But I don't see why we could do our own kind of events, if you like. Um, yeah, no, I think it's really important, yeah, to target particular yeah. people. But also, the, the point on you saying about um, how people approach you, their language and what they deliver to you, how they apply to you, their emails, whatever mm. i'm really open to all of that because i'm dyslexic anyway i i've done i've done a degree in, in uh, an ma in tv script writing which i absolutely loved and the, the teacher on it jim hill who was here in fact at democracy yeah, he yeah. said uh are you dyslexic Rob? And i said no yeah. <laughs> yeah. Typical, you are. <laughs> typical dyslexic answer that is. Yeah. No, no, I'm not dyslexic. Um, yeah. No, I understand there are so many different ways of communicating with people, and I'm really open to it. You know, I've got there is an actor in Birmingham at the moment who rings me up once a week, probably. He has autism, and he's working at the Birmingham Young Formers or Young Young Rep or whatever it's called. Oh. Um, and he was going to be in their summer show this year. Solomon, his name is. Really lovely man. Um, but he fell out of the he fell out of production. So I've kind of coached him, just talking to him on the phone, and I had to Zoom with him and everything about you know that you need to have consistency and you need to stick with this thing. If you want to do this, then you need to to be there and be present. And you might find that difficult and it might be scary, but you've got to do that because you can't just drop out of a production at some point and yeah. say, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to do this one. Yeah. That's just not part of the profession. It's not part of how this works. So I don't mind talking to anybody about that kind of thing because some people have real barriers to getting into this business. Yeah. And it can be social, it can be, it can be mental health, it can be all sorts of different things. But if you... If you can coach people and work with them and encourage them in the right way, there's no reason why anybody can't do this job. Can I just ask, is she? Um, do, do, have you considered people applying via video? Or, or even you, Rob? Yeah, good idea. Because a lot more organisations are doing that for, for it to be more you know, fair and equitable. Yeah. Um, just a short video instead of the, the written printed CD yeah, thing yeah. or filling out the form thing. The same information is asked for. Can you do a short video? Tell us yeah, what you've done and da, 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 and whatever. And people yeah. seem to do some people that that helps to make it accessible for them. 
Yeah. Yeah. For for stand up, definitely you ask for a video anyway because yeah. you want to see um what not performance, but like a, an interview video, you know, a sort of CV video, should I say, or bio video. And do you have to be standing up when you do it? Or do you just stand? <laughs> there we go. That's exactly why. I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting down, but I'm really a stand up yet. Yeah. Um, does that, does that, does that uh, address this, your point, is she? Yeah? It does, yes. I think um, the point I was making was not necessarily about um, language barriers. It was more about the confidence that comes across. So, for instance, um, uh, male male comedians will just come in and go, oh, I can do that for you. I'm free. Whereas female comedians will go, well, maybe, possibly, if you could squeeze me in. And and that's the kind of difference in confidence levels which mm -hmm. I recommend straight away. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any further questions? Got a um, it's been really interesting um, listening to you all, particularly from the acting side, because I'm a voice actor, so hide behind my microphone, but don't get seen on screen. Um, which is what I wanted to, to ask you really, Bob, is that you talked about the pandemic years. Um, I was in that camp where our work rocketed yeah. you know it was the best two years of my 10 years of business um and actually when you said what did all the actors do we thought they all went and ordered a microphone because yeah. <laughs> yeah, i did did you yeah, there yeah, you go yeah. um so i was busy with my voice work and also busy with trying to advise various actors who suddenly came to us that i'm doing it full time which is partly why i've come to my as well because there are people who want to so was that something that is that something that you do as part of the agency? Is it something you considered as a result of the pandemic to branch into voice work, or how does that fit into your? It's kind of agency? in my plan <laughs> to uh, okay. have a voice part of the agency. Yeah, okay. but, yeah, yeah. specifically. We need to chat. Well, yeah, yeah, we will. Yeah. yeah. It, it kind of leads into a question that I was going to ask if other people hadn't got any questions left. What are the range of um, skills that you represent? Because you don't just represent actors, do you? I know on your site you've got a creative section. Yes, so... and that's very small at the moment. But we we've just done we did we got some money from the Arts Council uh, 15, 16 months ago um, to work with writers because I'm really passionate about writing as well. Um, and so we got I think about fifteen grand to work with. Six writers, and maybe seven we had, I can't remember now. And each one of them was mentored over six to nine months. They had a piece that they um, were writing, and they worked with the mentor to improve the piece, the performance either on stage or in front of the camera. Um, and at the end of that period, then we, and through that period as well, we had, I think, six or seven master classes from uh, professional writers that came on and then gave a class as well, not only for the people who were doing the, the who were being mentored, but also for any other writers who were interested. So they, we call them red talks, and they they're open to anybody to because I'm all about sharing or you know demystifying this whole business. Well, um, we, we will definitely stay in touch. <laughs> you, as our first speaker, we would definitely like to invite you back, maybe to one of the other regions as we move around. <laughs> Sheila's got her thumbs up. Oh, Sheila, gets the last question. Go for it. Hi. I'm ever so sorry. I'm normally really noisy. <laughs> <laughs> I just wish you were a variety agent. I <laughs> 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 appreciate that. <clears throat> I can remember years ago, I think I did... Um... Sorry, I'm not... <laughs> I feel really embarrassed. <clears throat> I think I've been a, a walk on to for Coronation Street 50 times, did everything. But why is nothing in Nottinghamshire at all now? I'm sorry, I can't say much more. Sorry, Ian. <laughs> Desert. 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 For supporting artists, especially. For, yeah. for, for, for the various writers, directors, yeah. actors, dancers. <laughs> You know, it we 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 we've got something of a bit of a desert. Mm -hmm. I think Sarah, yeah. Bird Derby Theatre is incredible. Mm -hmm. The work she's done there, 
Um, do you ever get involved with Derby at all? Oh, well, well they're part of a network, yeah. a director like me, but she's... But I think Sarah, Sarah is definitely someone who I would like, I, I will ask to be a speaker. I think yeah. she would be yeah. amazing. She's done a red talk for us. She's yeah. Brilliant. I'm so sorry <laughs> I can't speak. Okay, Sheila. Talent, so it's it's a book. I've heard of your agent. Like, so your reputation book. actually precedes you. Are the red thing. talks um, online anywhere? Yeah, uh, some of them are. I don't. Some of them might be. I've never. I've not been very good at recording them and then putting them up online. But I'm well, I've future talks. Way. You know where yeah. I am. Yeah. yeah. So, does that answer your question? Sheila, the, it's generally, I think there is a, a desert and with Birmingham West Midlands, Tracy, thank you for um, zooming in to this call and for the East Midlands starting something from the ground upwards. And I think we talk about campaigning and talk about how can we make things better. To start with, we've got to have something. And I think recognising that we have built something and those of us that are here, and especially going up to November, you are founding members. Mm. And that without you, there won't be a future. So it's about where we all go next, what our experience is. And I think having Rob come and talk to us about agents, um, agency, we all need agency. Um, this will have been recorded. We'll share it with some members. But I think if there's no more questions, um, thank you so much, Rob, and a round of applause for that. Thank you for having me.